So my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Emily Terrell. It's April 22nd, 2021. We're at the Britain Tasting Room in McMinnville. Emily, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, first question for you, most important. Why wine? Well, geez, that's a hard question to start with. <laughs> I guess kind of why not wine? Um, wine I kind of arrived at during uh, university. Um, I was kind of exploring pre-medicine and I was doing a lot of pretty fundamental science research um, in a few departments during my undergraduate. Um, and kind of growing a little bit, I felt like very, um, a little bit trapped in the lab, a little bit trapped in the city. Um, and I, I was raised in a pretty rural place, um, always around gardening and animals and things like that. Um, and I began to kind of miss um, those aspects of life. And um, looking toward my future, I wanted something that would integrate a little bit more growing things, the land, as well as kind of a lifelong love of food and beverage. Um, and so just kind of coming of age at that time and beginning to be interested in beer and wine and growing things and things like this, um, I decided to kind of make the leap and go for a master's in food science um, with the target of wine, but also thinking that if wine was a total train wreck, I could also entertain myself in the food and wine world. So tell us about your kind of pre-wine life uh, uh, upbringing. You mentioned a rural, kind of a rural upbringing. Tell us about that and, and, and then your kind of education. Oh, sure. Um, so I was born and raised in northern Idaho, Sandpoint, Idaho. Um, kind of grew up on 10 acres. Always had, you know, cats, dogs, pigs, chickens, that sort of thing. Um, and spent a lot of time kind of hiking and gardening and riding my bike long distances to friends' houses um, and things like that. So then when came time to choose a college, naturally I wanted the total opposite. Um, so I chose University of Washington in Seattle. Um, nearly got hit by a bus my first day of school, but then I adjusted to <laughs> urban life fairly successfully. Um, and that's, I really, I studied music as well as science. Um, and I kind of tried out many, many things at university just to see what fit, what I liked. Um, I enjoyed learning about everything really. Um, and then kind of, slowly narrowing down first to pre-medicine and then deciding that I didn't think that would give me the sort of breadth and depth of life that I would want for mm -hmm. myself. You mentioned kind of discovering wine and beer as you, as you came of age. Was there a particular experience or moment for you where, where wine became something you were interested in? Um, kind of a combination of coming of age and then exploring the aisle at Trader Joe's actually. Which is funny because those wines, you know, I think the better wines that I had were probably international selections from Trader Joe's at that time. Um, now I don't know what I would think of those wines, but, um, but it certainly was enough to get me interested. And then that kind of also discovering fine food, going out to eat around Seattle, discovering different types of food. Um, I think that definitely drove the interest quite a bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned graduate school. So tell me about that program. Mm, so then I, once I kind of changed directions and decided to go toward food science, um, I ended up going to University of British Columbia for grad school. Um, I also looked at the Davis program, but um, I was dating a Canadian at the time. And I got, it was sort of a, a plus 20,000 to go there and a minus 20,000 to go to Davis, <laughs> which wasn't, uh, wasn't inconsequential in my decision. Um, and so there, and the other reason I went there was because they had a really well-funded laboratory um, that had a big analytics department, um, a wine studies center actually, and they were doing a lot of uh, omics research, so metabolomics, genomics, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I had done some work in molecular biology a bit in undergrad, um, so I was able to go into this lab, get pretty good resources and funding, and. Um, Ended up studying some various yeast strains and characterizing them um, in Pinot Noir. So, at what point did, at what point did you feel like you'd made the right decision, and then the wine was something you wanted to pursue? Um, well, that was interesting because when you go to research-based graduate school, you can get quite entangled. You kind of have to finish your research project and write it up before they allow you to leave with a degree. <laughs> Um, and I was a little bit, I needed to finish to get that paper, um, and I got a master's degree. Um, graduate school is kind of set up, so when you get your master's degree, you either 
take the green pill and go for your PhD and stay in research or you escape at that moment. Um, and making that decision to escape was correct for me, but uh, it's difficult to resist the, the draws of, you know, PhD level studies. Um, but I really wasn't sure that wine would be the right fit, of course, until I started working harvests. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something I knew I wanted to do when I entered graduate school, um, but I didn't get to do until I finished graduate school. Mm -hmm. So it was still a bit of an uh, experiment at that stage. Mm -hmm. But pretty much as soon as I started working harvests, I was like, yes, I really like this. So before we get to that, I'm going to back up for a second. You mentioned re your research. Tell us a bit more about the research with, with yeast and Pinot Noir. And, and did you choose Pinot Noir? Or was that just sort of what was there to work with? Um, so our lab was doing a number of projects, including work on um, like genetic modification for various yeast attributes. Um, I ended up not doing those projects, um, but I my, part of the whole lab structure was to um, find these yeast strains that may modulate different sensory at attributes in wine. Um, and my PI, my professor boss, um, would find these yeast strains um, collecting in vineyards and wineries. Oh, cool. um, and then we would characterize them and basically look at the, the uh, most central part of my project was is mixing yeast strains in a fermentation creating different metabolites than one yeast strain. And the answer was, yeah, probably. Are they really important differences? Ah, it depends on the yeast strain and the wine and all that. Um, but the reason it was Pinot Noir was because um, he isolated them from mm -hmm. a Pinot Noir re region. Was that your first real like experience with or with, with Pinot Noir? Probably yes, because you don't find a lot of really great Pinot Noirs at Trader Joe's. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, and that was, I mean, I was at that time, once you move to Canada, you don't have a lot of access to U.S. wine because of the whole structure there. Mm -hmm. um, and they do quite, they do some Pinot Noir in the Okanagan. That's pretty good. So when I began traveling over there, I kind of began to be interested in it. And mm -hmm. then as you learn more about the traveling, harvest working world of wine, you begin to become more intrigued by it, I think. Let's talk about that work, that harvest working world of wine. So you, you mentioned that was something you knew you wanted to do. You wanted to go out and try the, try the real thing. What was your first step in that after, after your master's? So my first harvest, it took me, I applied to 50 harvest jobs to get my first one. Um, it was in Australia, which is probably why I took 50. <laughs> they pay well there. Um, but I was lucky enough to land on the Mornington Peninsula at a 500 ton winery, which is quite small for Australian standards really, um, called Red Hills Estate, ironically enough, no relation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they, it was part of a larger company, um, but they basically hired me to oversee, run their lab. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe that's a lofty thing to say as an intern, but they were basically like, here's the lab, do this, do that. They trained me and then, um, it was definitely a lab harvest. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't necessarily what I was looking for, but with my grad skills, it made total sense and it was a good way to get into the industry. Um, but it was a really fun experience. I mean, it, we were a mile in from the beach. We had a beach house. They gave us bicycles. They bought us all of our clothes, gave us all of our food. It was very nice. <laughs> you could do worse. You could do worse. You could do worse, yeah. There were some spiders in the barrel room and things like that, but overall, a, a positive experience. Mm -hmm. And Australia was very fun. Um, then I went and did some vineyard work in the Barossa, mm -hmm. which was fun. Um, and of course, just getting, doing that first big international trip by yourself for reasons other than a two week holiday is, mm -hmm. I think, a really great and important learning experience for, mm -hmm. you know, young people or people of any age, really. Mm -hmm. So at that point, your, your most of your wine knowledge was, was kind of from the scientific background and kind of ex either from drinking it or from kind of learning about it in theory. So tell me about actually working a harvest, what was different about the actual world of wine versus what you kind of anticipated? Well, I'd made a lot of wine at lab scale. I'd done a little bit of like home, home brew playing around, <laughs> more beer than wine. But um, what is different is the scale. I mean, you don't think about the level of stickiness of a winery or the activity of an active ferment. You know, when you, I remember walking up to the first tank of, it was some kind of white and like get, getting ready to smell it. And of course you're just blasted back by the amount of CO2. Um, and just the very industrial nature of it. I mean, this, although it was a 500 ton winery, like this is a cat catwalks and giant tanks and heavy equipment. It hadn't totally occurred to me that I would need to 
be able to drive a forklift mm -hmm. or troubleshoot large electrical things. You know, it's um, more industrial than I think I'd ever really been working around mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what was next after Australia? Um, then I actually decided to go back to Canada. Canada is very generous, so as an international student, um, they gave me a three-year unrestricted work visa, which was pretty awesome. Um, and I knew I had the opportunity to go up there and work. It's pretty annoying and difficult for Americans to get work visas to Canada. Um, and I knew I could just like use the visa, work a harvest there. Um, and I'd had a relationship with um, Kelowna um, as the source of my juice for my research. And I'd made some connections there. Um, and Karen Gillis um, of Red Rooster mm -hmm. offered me a job and I worked in the cellar at Red Rooster, um, although I ended up working in the, one, in the um, lab as well. Mm -hmm. It turns out running like late stage malates and stuff is a good uh, make work project toward Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and she was really, that was a really fun experience too. It's beautiful up in the Okanagan um, and we had a small team. That was a 300 ton facility and we made like one tank of every variety. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of the only time I've ever done that. And I mean, it was also a very um, under, at that time they only had like, they had some funny cooling setups and things like that. Um, so it was kind of a troubleshooting facility as well. Which I think in all wineries there's a bit of that, but this one had quite a bit of design your own way to figure out this problem, which was cool. That's where I got better at driving the forklift. I got to learn how to do cellar operations basically. Didn't embarrass myself too badly, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, it was a fun time. Mm -hmm. In terms of the, the non-lab work, what, did you find something that, uh, that attracted you? There was, was there a kind of work you enjoyed or a, a part of the cellar you enjoyed working with the most? I mean, I've always, I enjoy the cellar. Sometimes when you're stuck in the lab in a big harvest, it kind of feels like being in jail. <laughs> <laughs> because there, most people are out in the cellar doing work, getting dirty, moving things around, and there's music, and then the lab is like, you know, precise, quiet, to the side, in a room. Um, so I always enjoyed the, uh, the cellar side of it. Um, during that harvest, I mean, everything is a struggle when you start in the cellar. Like, every clamp hurts your hands, half your stuff leaks, everything is not, you know, figuring out how to manage lines. Um, and I think you have to work extra physically hard when you're learning all those things before you kind of know how to work smart, not hard. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was definitely the harvest of that for me. But I enjoyed the wine movements. I enjoyed the pump overs. Everything was new and novel. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of learning in that harvest. Mm -hmm. Had you started to develop at that time kind of your own like wine identity or, or, or style? Had you kind of started to think like what kind of wine you wanted to work with or what kind of place you wanted to be? Uh, maybe a little bit. I really liked the Okanagan, but I could sense that this was in 2010. In their current state of development, um, I, I knew that I didn't know enough yet to stay there. Mm -hmm. I felt like I couldn't learn enough from enough people um, to kind of learn and access the kind of mentorship and the kind of quality driven winemaking that I needed to still learn. Mm -hmm. um, so no, I would say that I was definitely still a baby intern at that stage. <laughs> but it was interesting to me the, the way that we made so many different things there. I knew that I would perhaps enjoy something a little bit more focused. Mm -hmm. And it begins to become apparent that like Pinot Noir is a good, a good thing for that because there is so much precision in Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. So I know after Canada you're not finished traveling yet, so where did you go next? Um, well, I had to hit the the major travel hotspot of Blenheim, New Zealand. Um, yeah, and that was through the guy that I worked with in Canada who was like, oh, you have to go to New Zealand. Um, and that was like my biggest, biggest winery, which was still only 1,300 tons, not so very big. Um, but that was, you know, there's at that time 2,500 interns that descend on this small town. Um, and it's just like a wash with Sauvignon Blanc just everywhere. Um, and it was interesting seeing that scale. Um, and I was, I did a combo. That's the only night shift I ever worked. True seven to seven night shift. Um, and I was combo lab seller. So that was kind of a good combo. Although the seller work was, it was a fairly overstaffed harvest. And so we didn't really get to do as much. There's, there's this line of small, you know, between a small winery of 250 to 300 tons, you actually touch the wine and the grapes a lot more than once you're at this 
you know, six presses, fixed lines. Oh, that's, it's more automated and mechanized. Mm -hmm. um, so I missed kind of being closer to the wine. <coughs> Excuse me. But I, um, I did learn a lot more just seeing scale, seeing software systems, work orders, trying to keep, you know, I think there were like 15 of us, which is a small crew. I mean, at Indivin, there's like 100. Um, but trying to see how they run and organize all that. At this point, you, could, you had some comparison. So between different, different countries, different sizes, different, different styles of wine. Uh, what were the biggest takeaways for you from that in terms, of, uh, in terms of size, in terms of scale, in terms of types of wine? Um, let's see. I mean, there's just, there's so many good ways of making wine. And, you know, just because you've made the most exclusive bottle in the world that's very delicious and special, like, that doesn't mean that that's the only good way of making wine. Um, and so that was kind of a takeaway. The other interesting thing was working internationally with all those the thing about New Zealand is you, people are from everywhere. So on my shift, there were three Italians, a South African couple, um, and then we had some Americans. Um, and you hearing their opinions on the wine in New Zealand versus the wine of their home place um, was also very interesting. Um, not having, you know, I still hadn't worked in the US, so I didn't have a lot to add from my country, um, but different perspectives on quality, what is quality, mm -hmm. what is efficiency, what are we trying to accomplish here? Um, that was pretty interesting. What happens next? Um, so the South African couple um, had from their home winery um, an exchange program with a winery in France and they were able to connect me into that because they're awesome. <laughs> um, and so they were like, and so I'd actually arranged to work a harvest at Rees Vineyard um, and, and it was like, yes, yes, yes. And then they were like, or do you want to work in the Rhone? And it's the only time, and it was only what, May. So it was the only time I backed out of an internship. I was like, do you want to work at Reese? But when you get connected into a good winery in France and you don't speak French and you have no contacts there, <laughs> you take it. <laughs> so, um, so it was kind of, I was a little intimidated. I didn't study French. Um, I had never, I'd spent maybe a couple days in Paris, but no serious travels there. It was a little bit scary, um, but of course, as, as such an opportunity to see that, you know, that side of where many of our ideas are kind of based and started and things like that, um, I took it um, and went to, oh, well, before that, I guess, I spent the winter in New Zealand pruning, which was the toughest stretch of vineyard work I've probably ever done. Um, but that was, that was fun, and I learned a lot doing that too. And then I went to France, and then I got off the train and was like waiting for my fellow intern to pick me up, thinking like, oh my gosh, how am I gonna like sign language my way through this? And she pulls up, and she's British, and a fluent French speaker. Um, so thanks to her, had a great time in France, because we ended up becoming good friends, and uh, she could speak both. Total cheating on my part, though. I wish I had learned a bit more of the language. What was the wine experience there like? Wonderful, as you might expect. So the facility was actually not unlike this facility. It was um, down by the Rhone River, and it was a modern warehouse facility. Um, it was a partnership. Um, the winery is Le Vin de Vienne, um, and it's a partnership between Quiron, Viard, and Gaillard. Um, and it's a place for them to run a bit of a negotiant business, as well as make some wines in a modern facility. Um, so from that perspective, you know, they had things like jacketed tanks and um, must lines and things that the old caves of France don't usually have, which made it a nice kind of interplay between the old and the new. Um, the fruit quality, it was in, in Conru, um, fruit quality was extremely high. Um, barrel resources are great. Resources in general are great. And it had that French culture of you know, we work hard, but we live well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was really, you know, morning break with cheese. Um, and then these lu the lunches would actually nearly kill me because you'd work, you'd get started at like eight, have cheese break at 10, <laughs> and then lunch was at one, and it would be a four course heavy cream lunch, delicious. And then you would nap for an hour. 
And then you have to get up two hours later at three and work pretty much straight, no break, from three till like midnight. <laughs> <laughs> and it was not a shift schedule that I was well <laughs> adapted to, um, but it was it was really fun and seeing that caliber of wine and they really trusted their interns um, a lot with the wine. That was the first place that was like, okay, you're gonna run the white cellar and tell us what you're doing and then do it. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like, whoa, really? Um, and I think that's really an important moment of maturity in all wine careers is that moment of knowing that suddenly this is your responsibility. Mm -hmm. Like you're no longer just sort of doing one task at a time. You're suddenly kind of in charge or running the place. Or if you don't do this thing, probably no one will. Mm -hmm. And that's definitely was a, a moment for me. Mm -hmm. They were also incredibly generous. They intentionally would hire foreign people. They wanted to sh do a kind of a cultural exchange. The winemaker um, is from Tan Hermitage. And his family's there, and he never quite had the opportunity to travel, I think. And so for him, he, it's similar to what I've tried to bring here, that kind of cultural exchange of, I can't travel, but I bring the other places to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so at some point, you're going to find a place that you want to settle in, I assume. So tell me about the process at this point for you. What, what, what were you thinking at this point for what you wanted to be the next step? Um, honestly, I was thinking I just wanted to run around Europe forever. <laughs> no, but I mean, the, the frustrating and exhausting part of the harvest travel is you are working very hard for those months and then you're always like eye on the next thing. Um, so you're kind of putting together a whole little program for yourself every like four to six months. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I actually, again, back to the visa thing, I had this visa in New Zealand, the working holiday thing, last year. And you can extend if you work in the vineyard enough to cover two harvests. <coughs> so I decided that since I had that visa, there's like basically if you're an intern and you're not a national, you keep getting kicked out of places because your visas are always expiring um, and there's no winter work. Mm -hmm. So I needed to go south again. And I really love New Zealand and I was starting to become more interested. The France experience really drove my interest in like fine wine. Mm -hmm. Um, not that making wine in big tanks isn't fun, but, um, but just that specificity of matching wine to barrel and like origin driven um, expression of fruit and fine wine growing, you know, why site matters and what a good site is like and why. Um, and those things made me, knowing that I did want to go back to New Zealand, um, go for Central Otago this mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And what was different about that for you? Um, so in Central Otago, I ended up at Shard Farm, which is just across from the Lord of the Rings River scene near the bungee jump, halfway between Queenstown and Cromwell. Um, and I just ended up there because I emailed a bunch of places and they got back to me, which apparently was just total luck because um, they get hundreds of emails and it was like, oh, well, you just emailed on the right day. Um, but we had a really good interview, um, and when I got there, it's funny when you go international, you often don't get to try the wines before you go. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got there and I tried the wines and I was like, oh, thank God, they're really good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they'd actually uh, agreed to let me, I needed the vineyard work to extend my visa and I wanted to work in the vineyard. So I started working in the vineyard in January there. Um, which was hot and difficult, you know, leaf falling and thinning fruit and things like that. Putting bird nets on is a huge project there. Um, and then I got to go into the cellar, but because I was, I was not actually angling to go into the cellar, but the assistant winemaker was like, please <laughs> let me have some help here. Um, and so that was pretty fun because for the first time I got to participate in blending the mm -hmm. previous vintage. Um, and the winemaker was um, actually really kind about including me in that. It was just me and the, him and the assistant um, and tasting through lots and understanding, you know, his method was taste through the lots, rank them A through D. And it was one of the first times at work that someone had been like, okay, rank this and tell me why. Mm -hmm. And that's also another big kind of crest in kind of learning to be able to feel comfortable ranking or mm -hmm. deciding and then stating your reasoning. And actually someone listens to you 
How does that happen? <laughs> um, so that, that was really fun. And then harvest there was like very difficult, but very, it was another kind of moment of responsibility of like, if I don't do these things, they're not gonna get done. Um, and we did, I think, 500 tons there, and there were only like four of us. We ended up, that's the only time, we had an intern that was drinking on the job that ended up getting let go. It's a little dramatic. So we were a little understaffed <laughs> after that. Um, but that was kind of my, my, well, I guess France was my first, and this was my second really quality wine harvest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and making, you know, Rhone origin Syrah and New Zealand origin Pinot, those experiences kind of led me to be interested in origin Pinot. So at that point, again, now you've seen a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. and you're, but you haven't ever been in one place for very terribly long. You haven't no. really seen the whole process yet from, from your And that was a, began, began to be a frustration because you feel like, you know, my, your first couple of harvests, you're just trying to like grasp, like this is how I set up my pump and this is how I do this and this is that. And like, then you begin to put the package together. And then by, by yeah, your fifth harvest, fourth harvest, you're kind of like, okay, I know how to do harvest, but like, what happens after harvest? I don't know. So yeah, you're, you're right about that. Um, I did kind of want to go to Italy, but <laughs> in the end, I became very actually exhausted at that stage because it was nonstop travel and planning everything, getting it together. We were working some pretty hard hours. Um, so I decided maybe I should consider working in the US. Um, and I'd actually won um, an ASCV scholarship when I was in grad school and come to their conference in Portland um, in 2008 and been very interested in the Oregon wine industry in 2008. Um, but I knew that I, I thought that maybe I wanted to end up here rather than like starting here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I decided maybe it was time to go to Oregon. Mm -hmm. So I started applying. I was really late applying too because Char Farm tried to kill us all. But um, <laughs> I did start sending things out kind of in May, which it's pretty late. If you're trying to get the top stuff, you're applying in like maybe Feb, March mm -hmm. these days. Mm -hmm. um, and luckily I got, a, I got several offers um, and I ended up choosing to work at EREF because they were the only ones that offered me a combined um, viticulture enology role. Mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of an interesting, I didn't really know much about Oregon or EREF or anything like that. Um, I was just strictly picking on the experience of the job. Mm -hmm. um, but it ended up being a pretty interesting job because I got to work with Gary. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time they didn't have a VIT person in Oregon. So I spent the summertime kind of um, running around to all their vineyards um, with the idea that I did crop estimates a bit. It was sort of a supportive role, right? Because they have people running their vineyards, of course. Um, but I learned quite a bit just like looking at all these records, scouting vineyards, mm -hmm. doing things that I hadn't really done before, um, and then a ton of grape sampling, too. Um, and then they dropped me into the cellar for harvest, um, and that was, again, interesting, new, new place. America does a lot of things very differently, such as gallons <laughs> <laughs> um, and air pumps. I had never seen one of those before. Um, but harvest there was pretty fun. We were at the old facility up um, Mm -hmm. Warden Hill, mm -hmm. and there were all these different buildings, and I think they rent, they had to have rented six or eight forklifts. It was like, if you need something, you get a forklift and go get it. <laughs> so that, when it was, there were a lot of interns, and it was kind of a busy, hectic environment, and there were all these different things going on in all these different buildings. Um, and so from that perspective, it was just a lot of fun. It was also my first time working in um, a more corporate place that was like, no, we're not going to try to work 15 hours a day. You're actually going to work your shift and then go home. And it was like, wait, what? <laughs> that sounds fun. Labor law. <laughs> I was a little burned out after New Zealand. So, so it was kind of nice that, you know, you weren't like flat out the whole time, mm -hmm. um, which I think allowed me to meet more people, have more fun, mm -hmm. um, things like that. It's always this fine edge between wanting all the overtime for the money and the fun and then like also wanting to go out and make friends and go tasting and spend, yeah. all, spend all that money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and then at the end of Erath, and then I was like, oh man, I really I don't know what I'm gonna do now because you know, visas are worn out. Um, and just that that fatigue of being traveling for like years straight. Um, 
And so then they ended up having an opening, which of course was seller hand, um, but that was kind of what I needed. I think for women, getting that first full-time job is the toughest moment, um, especially if you're trying, as I was, to kind of like prove your seller skills, um, because as a scientist mm -hmm. um, and as a woman, they, those tend to be underrepresented. Mm -hmm. um, and I think securing that first, like, yes, I was a full-time seller hand, that speaks volumes to people who are hiring. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very happy to have that opportunity. Um, and then I worked with the men of ERAF. <laughs> Chris was seller master, mm -hmm. um, Ron was in the lab, and then um, I worked mostly with Marcus and Tim. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, you know, that was hard, hard seller work. We did a bunch of blends. We did a six week bottling run of Pinot Gris. Um, yeah, it was the grind for sure. Um, but it was, I learned, your skills really improve when you're doing that sort of seller work again and again and again. Mm -hmm. um, and I, again, that's important. And ERAF had the latest and greatest equipment. Like if it wasn't attached to the old facility, <laughs> they were willing to invest the money. Um, so they had really nice pumps everything like the inert gas methods that they use, the bottling QC, everything was at a really high level, um, which I think bringing those skills from a big place to a small place can be really valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Chris was great. All the guys there were very, very great for like being positive, teaching me stuff, being patient, things like that, mm -hmm. yeah. So we've heard some stories about that facility and about the facility <laughs> when, when it gets a little crowded. So tell me about navigating that. Was, it, was that unique to you having worked at all these different facilities? Was it fairly, or was it something you had kind of seen before and were ready for the challenge? Um, in terms of the busyness of the facility? In the, yeah. I didn't find it that busy. I think New Zealand was a little crazier. Um, the nice thing about the facility was the big courtyard. Mm -hmm. um, so during harvest, I always felt like there was enough space to navigate. It was annoying. There were a few annoying things like no drains and some congested type areas, but for the most part, I thought it flowed relatively well. Um, we didn't have any major issues. The annoying part about it for me was that, you know, you're always running outside and it's winter and it's probably raining. Um, so I would just like suit up in my rain gear and just go do my job. Um, but no, I didn't find the facility particularly um, difficult. Um, obviously the amenities could have been a bit better with, you know, floor drains and things like that, but part of the charm of the place is uh, working with what you have, I think, so, yeah. You mentioned one of the benefits was an ability to actually get out uh, and meet people and, and see, see things. So I'm curious about your sort of your first impressions of the Oregon wine industry as, as you started to meet people and see other places. What did you think about Oregon wine from, from at the beginning? Um, well, I actually, so I got my first um, housing here. I went on Craigslist right when I got the job and it was like, woman in wine industry seeking roommates. So I was like, sure, sign me up. Um, and it ended up being this really fun house with three other people in the industry and everyone worked at a different winery. And so collectively that was, we got to drink each other's wine. We got to talk, we met a lot of people. We hung out together, we threw parties. It was very communal almost immediately. Um, and then I met um, Claire. Claire worked at Erath with me. She's the associate at Brooks now. Mm -hmm. um, so we became friends and then we went out and did taste. But I mean, 2012 was a real, this is 2012. It was a very like um, social moment in the Valley. It was like the industry had suddenly gotten big enough to have a lot of people coming in. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I found it. I mean, I felt, I think then and still um, the big value of the Oregon industry is that community. People are willing to help each other. I mean, people are willing to share their experiences, sometimes with things that are, you know, difficult, like the smoke, like mm -hmm. microbial challenges, like other problems. Um, people are more willing to share and collaborate than I think most other places in the world. What about the wine here? What did you think about that wine? Um, at first, I, w I didn't quite know what to think. I'd come from um, Central Otago, and the wines there are pretty green. And um, the wines that we we're making at Shard Farm were very elegant. Um, and then coming here, I was tasting the 09 vintage and it was very warm. <laughs> um, and I was kind of like, huh, the interesting. New Zealand and Oregon have a lot of um, cross collab really. Like when you're in New Zealand, a lot of people are talking about Oregon wine and I had never really been here or tried all the wines. So it was interesting to like take that conception and then try them here. 
and then um, and at first I was like, whoa, these are like actually it's a warm region. And then the tens came around, and I was like, oh, okay, good. That's a relief. That's a relief. <laughs> um, but it was it was interesting how diverse the wines were here. Um, and how diverse, you know, my first introduction was driving around to all these vineyard sites and we must have had 30 that year. Um, and seeing the diversity of the fruit and the landscape and where people were growing grapes and which grapes were high reg highly regarded. Um, that was pretty interesting. Yeah. But I mean, at that time, there's, there's a lot of, there's like a unified organ, organ wine and then there's also a, a lot of diversity mm -hmm. in how people are approaching their products. So what happened next? Well, what happened next was the old facility was too old and they decided to not make wine there anymore, um, which was a big bummer for me having just procured that full-time job, um, which, and that was, so let's see, I worked Harvest and then I continued working there until about May, June. Um, and I applied and interviewed for, and then it was like, oh my goodness, I don't want to go on the road again. Like, how am I going to? find something in Oregon and stay. I really wanted to stay at that moment. You never quite know, you know, you're happy enough to go along and then something happens where you have to like invest much further to stay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but it was very clear that that's what I wanted to do. So I interviewed at a few places, didn't get a full-time job. And then um, I'd actually met Vince Vedrine, who was the Roberts assistant starting in 2010. He's now at Irvine Roberts down in Ashland. Um, I'd met him socially and we'd had some like good talks and I had my roommate we had visited this facility in 2012 um, right and this was that was their first year in this mm -hmm. building mm -hmm. so I kind of was like I liked Vince a lot we'd had some good talks I'd had the Britain wines I liked them um, and I could see that the facility like was going places kind of mm. new installing stuff growing um, and so I decided to see if I could work harvest here because they, you know, we're not hiring. <laughs> um, and so I, you know, Vince put me through, like, send me your resume, send me your cover letter. So I did all that. And then um, they did hire me. Great news for harvest. Um, and we did. And so that was my first harvest here. And so I started in August with the Chardonnay bottling. Nothing like mobile bottling to break you into the new facility mm -hmm. in 100 degree weather. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we did 260 tons with like three of us, me, Jeff Katz, and um, Ashley Campion, mm -hmm. and then a kid to help us with punch downs, our vineyard guy. Um, and that was a very, very hard harvest. Um, and then it was kind of like coming to an end and I was kind of like, okay, Vince, do I need to call my people in New Zealand or what's going on here? No, no, don't call your people. And I was like, w okay, but like, job, no job, maybe job. Um, and he basically uh, offered to keep me through racking season. We normally rack and return our wines in like January. Um, and then, but was like, okay, I think I'll have work through April. So then I was like, okay, well, I won't go to New Zealand because that covers that season. Um, and it ended up being that they, so I did that. I was a good racker. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then we agreed, they didn't quite have a full position at that time. Um, so then he's like, I think go through April and then you're off for three months and then you have a full-time job. But pretty ideal. And to me, that's like, okay, I'm going to Europe it's for sure. <laughs> um, so, so it felt so good to coming from, you know, coming from Erath and uncertainty to like be in this building, making good wine, feel like I had a roof over my head. <laughs> um, and just really liking the quality of the wine and the quality, like Robert's energy and enthusiasm and um, the fact that Vince and Robert um, then and now are just so focused on expression and quality mm -hmm. um, was really positive. And it was really, as soon as harvest started and everything, I could kind of feel and tell that, which mm -hmm. was great. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I worked through the racking season and then I went and my same friend who was the English speaker in France, um, we ended up doing a season of disbudding and suckering in Corsica, which was super fun. Not really great money or learning experience, <laughs> but we had a, so it was fun to have that. I felt like was my final kind of like freedom travel before really hunkering down to like, you know, full-time career track. Um, and then I came back and then, and then things 
felt very serious because it's like, okay, we got to get ready for harvest. We got to do this and that. Da, 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 da. Um, and that second harvest was like, oh, now I have some responsibility. Like this is this is hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, yeah. What, what was the role for you when you were hired full time, and, and and how did it kind of how did it kind of manifest? What, what were you mm. doing that first harvest? Yeah. So uh, then I'm, first I was intern. Then I was like, you know, no man's land. While they kind of figured out, while basically they decided to have a position, um, and then they offered me. Um, the position of seller supervisor, um, which it wasn't, Robert has a lot of um, views on titles. Like in his mind, a seller master is like a Napa large winery, does all the mechanical stuff, like master of the seller. Um, and he didn't think, he doesn't, he doesn't think that uh, this facility really has that position, <laughs> um, which is why we're always seller supervisors. But basically that's lead seller, um, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And, um, in that, in that position, you're helping with training the staff, you're making sure they don't screw anything up, you're basically eyes on the ground and the primary kind of mover of wine, topper of barrels, director of work orders, making sure things are as they should be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you're making, basically being the winemaker's eyes on the ground, mm -hmm. yeah. And did you have an idea in your mind at that point of what you kind of wanted to do long term? Did, was was seller work still what you were thinking? Did you have other ideas? Like what, what was kind of your your in your mind your path forward? I mean, the path forward for me has always been winemaking, um, but I think if you want to make wine in a small intentional way, you need to master the lab and you need to master the seller, and you need to master you know tasting and decision making. Um, and so for me in that moment. Um, the path forward was get into a company that you like mm -hmm. um, and try to get those seller skills mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because I felt that that was my weak area. Um, I didn't want to get, it's also a liability of, well, people with graduate degrees but also women to get stuck in the lab um, and I wanted to make sure I didn't do that and mm -hmm. I want, as a woman winemaker, um, one of the difficulties can be that people think you don't know what's going on in the cellar or that you don't know how to run the big toys and things like that. Um, so it was pretty important to me at that stage to make sure that I did know how to do all those things. Mm -hmm. Tell me about Robert's style as you came to know it and how it kind of meshed with the wines you wanted to make and, and, and the style you would kind of develop for yourself. Um, yeah, Robert's style is, Robert really wants to make site expressive wines. Um, I think his primary goal is to make wines of like great clarity and fruit expression. Um, and wines that really speak of the place. Um, and you can kind of see that because we make all these different wines from all these different sub-locations and they're all very different. Um, and that really aligned with what I'd sort of come to value in my quality experiences around the world. Um, with that precision of location um, and intentional, you know, kind of, uh, he really lets the vineyard dictate which wines we're making. Mm -hmm. Um, like sub areas of the vineyard kind of are, oh yes, these are, these taste different. These could be two different wines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I really like the property aspect driving the wine. Um, and also I think, you know, he's, he's a fan of oak, but not lots of oak, supportive oak. Um, and okay. you know, dial, he just, he and I totally agree with this. Um, you know, precision winemaking is when are, how are you growing the grapes? Where are you, where are you growing the grapes? How are you growing the grapes? Picking, how are you picking the grapes? Um, how are you handling them in the cellar to extract basically just right at the height of expression? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then basically making sure that you have every resource you need to make a really good wine mm -hmm. in terms of tools, dry ice, you know. Pre de stemmers, presses, pumps, those all end up having a quality impact on your product. So tell us about your kind of progression here at Britain from, from that initial mm. initial work to, to, to now. What, what has changed about your role and, and what, ha what are some of the things you've worked on that you're particularly proud of or excited by? Sure. Um, well, so interestingly, so when I started, I was really like Vince's right hand. Um, and then Vince left. Um, and then I was the only one here. And that kind of scared <laughs> all of us a little, I think. Um, and that was really kind of when Robert and I started working more directly together. Um, and we can, I think he kind of realized like, whoa, like 
I just, you've kind of been working here the whole time and like we haven't really, you know, I at that time was busy working in the cellar. I wasn't really sitting down for a lot of tastings with them or anything in that role. Um, and so I think that was kind of a moment of the company where Robert had to kind of be, like think about, okay, Vince is gone, like Emily's here. Um, and so we, he kind of redefined roles, brought in new people, brought in more people. Um, those early years, we were really running a skeleton crew and I think he realized that that just wasn't quite enough mm -hmm. to really do it, everything with the precision that we wanted to do it with. Um, so then I sort of transitioned more into an assistant winemaking role. It took me a couple of years to get that title. Um, he brought in another person as associate winemaker and the three of us kind of collaborated, but I was at that point, I began running the lab. I'd already sort of started running the lab because I just can't get enough of the lab apparently. <laughs> but our lab here is very, you know, running, running the lab here means running free sulfurs, running pHs, and setting up a lot of benchtop tasting trials. That's the real lab angle. Um, and then I began participating in blendings. Um, first kind of with Robert and Britton and then slowly with time with the clients as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of, you know, being trusted to blend with the clients is a big, mm -hmm. a big compliment. Mm -hmm. um, and let's see, so we kept on kind of moving forward like that and then I began writing work orders, I began keeping track of, you know, you just kind of grow based on what needs to be done and based on how we want to make these very fine wines. Mm -hmm. You talked about clients, obviously, another, another part of the work here. So, t so tell me about that. Tell me about that kind of work in addition to Britain label. Uh, what are the expectations on you? What, what is your role there? And, and how do you make it work with, with it? everybody wanting something probably slightly different? Mm, and so we're, um, we have kind of an interesting, we're technically a custom crush facility with our clients. We hold the, they don't do their own work. We do the work. Um, <coughs> but it's a very... Um, custom crush, shall we say. Uh, we, Robert is, you know, in his late years of his career, um, and he's very particular about who he wants to work with and why. Um, he likes working with clients that are as excited about wine as he is, mm -hmm. and he likes working with clients that own farm and have an interest in their own estate properties. Mm -hmm. Um, and so he's kind of cultivated this like really interesting, fun group of clients who are all like also really into wine and pretty nerdy about it, um, which makes it really fun. But um, basically our aim is to um, make the wines that the clients want to make. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's important for us to talk with them about what wines they like and what style wine they like and what, you know, how can we shape the wines that they have on their properties to best reflect that. Mm -hmm. um, and then it comes to, so we kind of philosophize what we want the wines to be and then come back and like figure out how to make them, mm -hmm. sort of. Mm -hmm. um, and we, you know, we do the breadth here. We make some wines that are Demeter certified um, and we make some wines, you know, everyone, we make some wines that have 35% new oak. Mm -hmm. um, there's kind of everything in the middle too. Mm -hmm. Um, but now I, I spend a lot of time interacting with the clients. I am their first contact point. They're always welcome to call Robert, but they know that if they email, it might be me that they hear from first. <laughs> um, and Robert and I both spend a lot of time meeting and talking with them. Um, I schedule tastings. We kind of make sure everyone is up together. Um, but we're, our clients are very involved and active. Um, and they certainly don't have to be, but that's kind of why they're a good fit here because mm -hmm. they're so mm -hmm. excited to be in the wine industry. Something you've touched on a couple of times throughout this is sort of the, the, the sort of confidence building part, parts of your career, the responsibility parts. And a couple here you mentioned the kind of the idea of, of blending for clients and of now of, of liaison, liaising directly with clients. Tell me about for you, was there a part or have there been points along the way where you have felt like this, I, I got this, I, I, I am, I'm a winemaker now, or you know, do you know what I mean? Like, is there, a, has there been times when you felt like that you, you, you are ready, for, you're ready for the next step, you're ready for what you're doing? Or has it been kind of more gradual than that? Um, no, there's definitely, yeah, there's definitely been moments. I was always, you know, there's some interns that will run around on their third harvest and call themselves winemakers. And that was never me. 
Um, I always, yeah, I do think that you need to work up to being deserving of whatever your title is, you know, seller hand enologist. Um, but I think um, after Vince left, when I had really moved into the role of writing a lot of the work orders um, and being in the tastings, I feel like you can't really call yourself a winemaker if you're not involved in tastings and blendings and organizing and logistics, you know. Um, there's a long list of things mm -hmm. that I think mm -hmm. it takes to really internalize winemaker. Um, and I probably got there, oh, I don't know, probably in 2016, I would say. Um, so I started here in 13. Um, and so probably, I felt really masterful in the cellar by maybe mid-end of 2014 and then not really winemaker until a couple more years. Um, but I think that's also, you know, now if I imagine like, for example, we're ordering barrels, like I can look at a barrel that I'm familiar with and imagine what it tastes like. Mm -hmm. Things like that, or like I can imagine a wine that we make for the Britain label and imagine what I want it to taste like. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of familiarity um, as well as kind of having a good grasp and control of all the moving parts that I think really brings the package together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In your case, you're working with someone like Robert Britton, who has a very, very specific idea of what his wines are going to taste like, uh, based on this, like you said, the site specificity. Tell me about kind of aligning with that, aligning, aligning your palate and aligning your, your so that you can work on the, in the, that, at that level and feel confident that he'll be, that he, he will agree with your decisions. Well, I mean, we basically agree with each other's decisions. Mm -hmm. We rarely disagree, and I think that's, um, a matter of tasting together for years and years and years. And I don't know, you know, we do often talk and kind of worry about cellar palate. Are we too off in this one direction? We had a little tasting here in the cellar. It was the only tasting we really got to do last year because of COVID with another wine brand. Um, and the, me, Dallas, Ray, our cellar staff here, and Robert were almost all in agreement, and the other wine brand was completely opposite. And we were like, was it cellar palette? I don't know. Um, but I, I think like Robert and I, sometimes we'll describe, we have kind of developed our language of tasting, um, which is not particularly poetic, but I think it means when I use a word, he knows what I mean by mm -hmm. that word. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's been really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, the, you know, the thing that I wanted back when I was in New Zealand seeking that full-time job was really that um, the duration of experience. Um, and at the time, I thought that would just be like one or two seasons of like, oh, this is how this works. But really, that's year after year of working with the same grapes mm -hmm. and seeing how those grapes react by season, over time, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. And I think. I've worked here long enough and with those Britain wines long enough to know kind of the expectations that we have for those wines, which mm -hmm. is pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned briefly earlier uh, 2020 and it's some of its interesting and unique challenges. So I want to talk about those challenges. I'm going to start with the pandemic and start with, start with a, a year ago or so. Um, tell me about the kind of the, the effects the pandemic had on, on your work and, and, uh, and from your perspective, effects it had on the on the industry in general here um yeah the pandemic was brutal i remember um coming back to work after the christmas break and ray and i are kind of nerdy and we had started reading this story about this weird virus and we were like hmm, i wonder if that's gonna amount to anything and then we continued reading about it through january and then finally things were looking pretty serious right before our rosé bottling um which was in march and at that bottling, we were like, should we be wearing masks or something? I don't really know. Like, should I wear gloves to serve the sandwiches? Like, normally we've had a history of being a pretty friendly and like fun, you know, buffet style bottling lunch. <laughs> so we had to rein that in a bit. Um, but what we ended up doing during that first bottling was just um, serving with gloves and then eating down here spaced out. Um, and that was sort of the beginning of pandemic conduct at the winery. Um, bottling was fine, no one got COVID, great. Um, and then pretty quickly we shut the TR. Mm -hmm. And um, Robert and Ellen were very, they're very conscious of our safety here working, 
um, and conscious of the fact that if we accidentally brought something in through the TR that we all caught, we would not be able to take care of the wines for, you know, we didn't really know what COVID was back in those days. It in some ways was more scary or that more scary than because there were just so many more unknowns about, you know, the death rate or like how long you'd be out of work or what might happen to you. Um, so we were pretty proactive immediately. I, uh, you know, when they did that, the full shutdown, I became the social distance officer. <laughs> um, and there was the, the one day Robert called and he's like, I think we need to shut this facility. So we were like, okay, there's the three of us that work here in production year round. And, um, and so we were like, all right. So we all went home and then we were like, well, like now what? <laughs> <laughs> and so we shut the facility for like, you know, two days. And then we were like, well, I mean, we're essential. I guess we'll go back to work. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and we kind of, you know, the nice thing about being a small team and the really nice thing about being a family business is you can pretty much design protocols that suit you. Um, so we were able to implement distancing pretty easily. I mean, there's three of us that work in 12,000 square feet, so it's not too hard from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, we were very happy. We were declared essential, so we were able to pretty much get away with the pleasure of going to work as usual. Um, obviously the social life took a big hit as did our DTC sales. Um, but that having that normality in that spring season was very sort of good and obviously good for the wines that we could come and work on them. Mm -hmm. um, but then things obviously started getting weird. Um, sales are big, big bummer. And our clients started wondering if they should sell off some bulk inventory. Um, we did end up selling some bulk last year because people were trying to read their inventory demands. Um, and of course, knowing how the 2020 vintage turned out, that ended up being possibly a regretful decision. <laughs> it's just, it's been such a, you know, when you're in, in a place or in wine for uh, so long, you kind of know the pattern of like, okay, we order the barrels in April, we bottle wines in August, we work harvest, and the pandemic followed by the smoke has just like thrown all that on its head. So um, we did bulk some wine. Um, Tom, our national sales manager has been working really, really hard, you know, having to do all that remotely zooming and emails and things like that um but we just kind of muddled through and we were you know had some clients that really backed off on barrels and then changed their mind and then loaded up on you know everything is just mm -hmm. no one has all the answers to the dynamics of um both the market and um the wine qualities mm -hmm. Harvest was terrible during the pandemic let's, too. Let's talk about harvest. Let's talk about harvest. <laughs> was there ever a more depressing time in the wine industry? Um, yeah, so we had kind of figured out how we were at least gonna do harvest. I had hired an entire international crew that then slowly fell away during quarantine. Mm -hmm. So then I had to hire an entire American crew, um, which ended up, we had a, actually a very good crew. Um, and luckily we found enough people to hire, which is a big problem mm -hmm. and um, we had arranged, you know, we had our lunch and we figured out who's doing lunch duty and all spaced out and wearing masks gets really sweaty, very, not very fun. Um, and then that smoke rolled in and kind of all bets were off. Um, it is funny how your mind goes to the problem most at hand. Cause I can definitely say that during that smoke, I was not worried about COVID like one tiny bit. <laughs> um, and we weren't really, you know, at first it was like, oh, that forecast won't come to pass. Like, no way. And then it was like, oh, like, no, but the smoke, this will be like a day at most. It won't affect our grapes. Like, it's fine. It's fine. And then, you know, the, the change from this is going to be a wonderful vintage to, I don't know, to we're totally screwed was mm -hmm. very emotionally wrought, I think, for everyone. Um, and I think the biggest difference during harvest was just that there was no happiness. <laughs> And I mean, everyone from, you know, the client down to the intern could sense that and feel that. And um, people didn't want to visit, you know, we couldn't really encourage that anyway because of COVID and there wasn't, you know, there just wasn't that sense of accomplishment and fun that you normally have making the wine. It wasn't fun to taste through the tanks. It wasn't, it was just really challenging and you had to kind of keep your you had to do your COVID stuff. You had to like stay optimistic. You had to do your best with these, um, these wines that you didn't know the ultimate 
the ultimate um, situation with, um, mm -hmm. and you had to just kind of like continue pushing through, and that was really hard because I think so, I didn't realize how much of a good harvest is just tied up in like the excitement and the joy of doing all that, and when you have so many difficulties happening all at one time, it's it's difficult to work through and to try your hardest on these wines that you're, you know, you don't really know how they're going to turn out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For you and the as the situation became clearer with the smoke that it was going to be going to be trouble. Tell me about the, the sort of the decision making process for for you guys here and 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 what you were what you were worried about at the time and then what you what the decisions you made what, what the ramifications were like what, what what were the key decisions you made and what was the result? Yeah. Um, well, we were worried about everything. <laughs> um, and I think, I think some of the, the key decisions, well, when do we pick this fruit? And how quickly can we get it off? Do we want to play that game? It ended up that we couldn't really play that game because the fruit really wasn't ripe yet. Mm. Um, and then also, you know, do we want to make these wines? Um, and everyone wanted to. Um, some people cut back. It, some people cut back their volumes, but honestly, the natural set was so light that everything was way, way, way down anyway. Um, so it would have been more like a 2012 vintage, perhaps, you know, if we had not had the issue. But um, and then it was, you know, the industry for all its good community is full of gossips. <laughs> and so hearing about what everyone was doing and trying and thinking and feeling, it, it became just like a swarm of bees and you kind of just had to like go back to the science, read what you could. The conclusion is that very, you, like if you're worried about smoke impact, you just probably shouldn't be making the wine. Light pressing and things like that are not really going to make enough of a change to turn it around. So what we decided was, you know, not knowing the level of impact um, that we would make our wines as we normally make our wines mm -hmm. um, with the idea of having as much wine there as we could to then if we needed to remediate, to remediate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this was a good time to have the lab background that you did, I imagine. We were all reading a lot of papers. We had some experience with a uh, smoke affected wine from Southern Oregon that we had a couple years ago. Um, a limited experience, but we were all reading as many papers and they were having the um, OWA OW, OW, or B webinars and we were watching those and we were hearing perspectives. Mm. Um, but I mean, what can you do? Like it's harvest. You're not normally thinking about lofty philosophies. You're like trying to not, you know, trying to stay awake long enough to do all your pump overs. Um, and so it was kind of a, your brain can only take so much of that, you know, so deal with COVID, make sure your staff is good, you know, make sure everything's being executed, read some papers. Um, but we ended up not, so the only thing that we did decide was definitely a good conservative idea was to take bigger press cuts. Mm -hmm. um, because in our experience with that other wine, the harder you press and the more you smush around those skins, if it's a problem, the problem will be greater the more you do that. Mm -hmm. um, so we did make some press cuts. Um, and other than that, we decided to make the wines and fix them later, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> evaluate them later. Um, and that's what we ended up doing. And that, you know, it's funny because I think even then I was like, okay, well, we'll make them and then we'll see and then everything will be very clear and we'll do what we need to do and that'll be it. Mm -hmm. But it still isn't very clear and it seems unlikely to ever have, you know, we've decided that, you know, the science is just not there yet. And that makes it really frustrating because when you want to examine things, you really can't. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so you're always making decisions in the dark. Um, and so ch sharing, it's also been really interesting sharing that dialogue with our clients, um, kind of learning, trying to learn one step ahead of them, but also trying to, you know, this is what we know, this is what we think, and here's our choices. Mm. But I think we will make some good wines from the 20 vintage, but it, those will be wines made with a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> yeah, and we're all looking at this dry streak, like 2021 better be a good year. <laughs> that is the real take I want from uh, 2020. But it was just kind of that feeling of, what bad thing could possibly happen next? <laughs> don't even say that. Like, don't even, don't even say it out loud. The creamery burned down, did you hear? <laughs>
<laughs> speaking, of, speaking of fires, right? So we talked a little bit earlier about sort of the, your initial impressions of, of the Oregon wine industry. I'm, I'm curious what has changed in your eyes in the Oregon wine industry, both the industry and, and the wines themselves, and, and kind of what you see as you look ahead for the industry. Oh, wow. Um, I think what's changed, I think the quality continues to go up. Um, and I think I saw the industry grow a lot and I saw a lot of people coming to the, I th hearing, having heard of Oregon worldwide, being attracted to come work in Oregon for a harvest or forever, um, being able to get jobs in Oregon. I mean, when I was lucky enough to get my cellar hand job at Erath, I didn't know of any other intern that was able to stay because the industry was just not quite big enough then. Um, and now I think there's a lot more opportunity for people at all levels in the industry. Um, but I also think, you know, we're kind of in a position where we need to move forward to the next step if we're going to sustain this like big size and growth and popularity. Um, and it's interesting watching brands kind of try to do that, you mm -hmm. know, through whether it's um, like on premises wine club, like how are they translating mm -hmm. and you know as I move forward in my production career you realize more and more how much of the success of the business depends on that hospitality side and sales and strategy there it's pretty interesting you talk about taking that next step or in, into the next stage is there is there a, a benchmark for you of, of what what it would what that would mean for Oregon wine I think being continuing to be more known mm -hmm. out in the world of wine, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, to be considered a benchmark style, not only for Pinot, but perhaps also for Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. um, and I think being sought after as a true wine destination, mm -hmm. um, which I think we're getting there, but I don't know that we're quite there yet. You brought up a couple times during the interview, um, sort of some of the, the, the pigeonholing that happens to women who want to be in the cellar, uh, who want to kind of follow the path you follow. So tell me about your experiences uh, and, and, and trying to get to the point you've gotten and, and how you feel women are treated in the Oregon wine industry through kind of your perspective. Um, I think it's continued to really improve the opportunities, the how seriously women are taken, the opportunities they're able to have, the positions they're able to hold without being, you know, given a different set of opportunities than men. Um, I think it's really hard to be a female seller hand. That's probably the hardest role um, for someone to like look at your build and be like, I think they can do the job. <laughs> um, and yet women interns are some of the hardest workers. Um, and I think often because, and I totally do myself, you have to be a little bit smarter about the work in order to be as efficient, because you can't have the brute strength. You can't be like, oh, I'll just like grab that second level barrel, pull it down, no problem. <laughs> um, but I think, um, on the other hand, there's many men that get stuck in the cellar that are not given the opportunity to proceed either to the lab or to the winemaking track. Um, so I think it's just really important to be versatile and take advantage of, of your opportunities where they come. Um, most of the bad things that I've experienced are silly things like a delivery person looking to the oldest white guy and assuming he's the boss. Mm -hmm. That used to bother me. Now it really doesn't. I mean, they're just trying to get their job done. Um, and I, I do think that the Oregon industry is more forward thinking than the world of wine. Um, and I think the wine industry is more forward thinking than many other industries. <laughs> so I think we're coming right along. Um, that certainly doesn't mean that I never feel it or won't ever feel it again, but um, I do think progress is being made. There's organizations now, um, and I think there's more opportunity for dialogue about these things, where even five years ago there was really no dialogue, um, and you just kind of had to tough it out. Um, and I think there's a, a pretty strong and dynamic group of women winemakers now here in the Valley, which is cool and exciting. Um, and. I think that, you know, we always try to hire like a balanced intern crew of men and women. Mm -hmm. um, when I've never, I've never really had anyone, I feel like now that I've really grown into my position, I've never felt like someone was questioning my ability to be a winemaker or lead or anything like that. Um, but when you do the hiring, I guess you can make sure that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the perks of hiring, yes. And I do think the younger generation um, you know, the wine industry community tends to be fairly educated, fairly aware, and I, I do think the younger generation is 
much more equal opportunity and then not only in terms of not discriminating but also in expecting women to go get the tools and women to like do the heavy lifting mm -hmm. um which i think is as it should be mm -hmm. yeah so we talk about the, the future of the industry a little bit tell us about the future for you what, what do you see as you look ahead for for your work and for your work here at britain and and perhaps other projects oh that's a an interesting one um the work here at Britain is very rewarding and it's fun to really continue to do precision winemaking for our clients. Um, I think that's what we really offer, can offer is that ability to narrow in on exactly what they want to make, exactly the property, um, and really help them create their wine goals, mm -hmm. which is really cool. Um, for me, I mean, I think what I don't want to do a lot of more paperwork than I already have to do. Um, and I'm not really attracted to like corporate politics of climbing those ladders. So I think winemaking of small projects is totally where I want to be. Um, and having that ability to be hands on. Um, and what I really like about here is the ability to, you know, if you want to buy a thing or you need a thing or whatever here, either I can just buy it or I just go one door down and say, Robert, can we buy this thing? And it's immediately, you know, heard and considered. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think um, sometimes working in bigger structures, you don't have that problem solving opportunity. Um, so I find that really rewarding here. Um, I hope that our little brands continue to do well. It's a tricky time to be a little premium brand mm -hmm. um, and a trickier time to be in that mid range we belong on restaurant lists, and when the restaurants aren't open, it's hard to um, motivate. And I think that's why we need to continue to kind of attract people to come and try Oregon wine and become intrigued, because that's what's going to sell the bottles. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, you have to sell those bottles for high dollars if you're going to afford your barrels, your nice fruit, and all those things. Do you have any intention of starting your own label at some point? I've watched several friends start and stop their own labels. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. I've helped some of them make them. Um, and I really, I don't think I'm really very drawn to wine sales. And so I don't really think that's my angle for now, unless I encountered a really great business partner that loved that side of the world. So if someone were to come to you and ask for your words of wisdom on, on joining the wine industry, what would you tell them? Man. Um, I would say make sure you're, well, make sure you're having fun because like we are all here to do something that we love and try to turn work into something more enjoyable than clocking in and clocking out. Um, and also make sure that you're behind the wines of the place where you're working. I think that's really important and sometimes understated and you can't always be if you're traveling and getting experience. But um, I think that's an important consideration because if you're gonna seek mentorship and learn how to make wines a certain way. Hopefully you like them or you just have to forget all that immediately. <laughs> uh, last question for you, we're gonna get a little philosophical on you. I'm curious your perspective on this given all the places you have seen wine, but in your, in your opinion, what's the role of wine in society? Um, I think wine is pretty kind of part of the glue of keeping the community together. I think wine is all about um, that, you know, that idea of sitting around table with food and drink and talking and laughing. Um, and I think that really, that sort of interaction is what binds people together in a way that we're at risk of losing with our love of smartphones and living alone. Um, <laughs> and so I think, I think having those good times with friends and family around the table, um, hopefully with good food and good wine is pretty critical to our, uh, continuation of community and the good stuff of life. I like it. That's all the questions that I have for you. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover here today that we should have covered? I don't think so. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time, for your hospitality, for your great stories and answers there. And uh, we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Thanks for having me.